Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm about to introduce our speaker, but I wanted you to know that the, Ma the Reverend Matthew Rivers, who's sitting here with us today, has agreed to be our next month's speaker. So <laughs> ask anyone that went to the men's conference and ask me, and you will see that um, we'll be blessed. It will be, um, it will be a wonderful event, and so as will tonight. Uh, but just quickly before I introduce Jay, I wanted to thank Lynn for that uh, wonderful testimony. I mean, the question, yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> and the question that Jay is going to ask is, is uh, men in the church, is there a future? And the, que and the, the answer is decidedly yes. I don't want to give it away. Uh, yes. The question will be how many? Because the growth and the future of the church is dependent on the conviction and the courage of men. It's not exclusively dependent, but it is in large part dependent because the Lord has um, called us to a certain level of responsibility within his body, um, the church, and to the extent that we have failed <clears throat> that responsibility, we see the decline and the demise of the church. But the church has promised to never have the gates of hell prevail against it. I mean, um, so we're not worried about the existence of it, but we are worried about what a weak and anemic and menless church would look like, which would be what we look around and see um, all around us, which is that churches that are confused about their purpose, men that are confused about their role and responsibility, and ultimately families that are left rudderless and helpless to the wind and waves of life. That's what we see. And so when I talk about men's ministry, and I said this in the, um, the interview process, so blame Jim, um, but I think that this is not only an essential part, but a crucial part of the work of the church, which is to call men to the level of uh, accountability, responsibility, and in fact courage that they have been given the opportunity to slough off. Because our primal sin, as we saw in the garden, is that we are fundamentally cowards. This is the problem. We don't stand up when we should, we don't speak when we should, and when we're called to speak, we don't know what to say. And so this is what we are doing is we, and I'm talking to myself here, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father, a husband, and a son, and so I'm, I'm talking to myself, but this is what we're doing here with the BMOC, the Being Men of Christ, is that we are, we are veiling ourselves of speakers and opportunities and people to help encourage and inspire us to, to uh, in the parlance of the modern world, do better, right? But we're not looking to do better in sort of a, uh, a non-Christian way. We're looking to do better as like Lynn has just inspired us to be men with courage who stand up, show our vulnerabilities, and in our weakness proclaim the strength of the Lord. And that's what, so that's our commitment here. I know it's the first time I've been able to speak to you all about this, and I'm going to get out of the way. But Jay Krause is someone who's inspired me along these lines. Um, when I arrived here in the diocese, I was a, a broken man. In many ways, uh, we had been through a, an ordeal, um, and it was not entirely of uh, not my own making. Um, and I'm grateful for the Lord's provision and His mercy and His providence to bring us to this diocese where there were men like Jay who saw the need for encouraging men who had devoted their lives to the equipping and 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 sustaining of men. And we became fast friends at Sushi Taro almost four years ago now and have stayed in touch ever since. Uh, Jay's a priest, um, he's, a, um, he's a successful businessman who's also um, has a father of five sons. He is um, just a, a, an inspiration to me, and he'll tell you more about his story, but Jay, I couldn't speak the way I do, have the conviction I do, and wouldn't be as encouraged in the ways that I am without your ministry, wow, so thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for you. that. Jay Krause. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, let me help you. There you go. Is this working? Okay. It is working. Okay. Move this out of the way. Um, well, good evening, and thank you so much, JD, for that introduction. He had described our relationship, and um, I so appreciated his invitation to come to St. Luke's Hilton Head, which is the southern part of the diocese, for those of you who may not know the geography from Myrtle Beach down to Hilton Head. Um, and my good friend, Matthew Rivers, who some of you got to know at the men's conference. Um, he is my two by two buddy tonight. Um, Luke 10, one, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. He never sent his disciples out alone. 
and that is a men's ministry mantra for us for 20 some years. So, and Matthew, I, for those of you who were at the conference, I am uh, walking in his footsteps in, in that I'm trying to preach the way he preaches. Uh, and I'm only on step one, step one. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Matthew. Clarification, uh, I am a layman. I did, yeah, sorry, buddy, sorry. Um, I, I'm not sure if this reverend elevates me or demotes me, but I'm a layman, as you all are as well. Uh, at your table, you have a couple of things. You've got a sheet of paper to just write some notes down on, and then you have some flyers here about men's ministry opportunities in the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina. Um, let me say, frankly, I'm going to follow in Len's footsteps here tonight. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but um, in JD's inter introduction, um, because my message to you tonight is faith in the home, and uh, that is our most important mission field, and a place I have really invested a lot of myself over many years. Um, and I have been so blessed to, for the last 25 years to serve as a layman, uh, both in the Episcopal Diocese of Southwest Florida and now in the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, leading men's ministries, because it's, it's a passion I've had for 40 some years, and I was able to move into full-time ministry in 1999. Um, I wanna highlight a couple things to, to, to kind of follow in Len's footsteps about how men's ministry and the life in the church impacted me as a dad, as a husband, uh, and as a leader. Um, just to give you a flavor of what can transpire in the life of the church, as J.D. was pointing out, uh, when we focus attention on men, that formation process. Then I'm gonna turn our attention for just a little bit to two issues that have affected my effectiveness in men's ministry over the years that will not be unfamiliar to this group. And then I'm gonna finish by asking you all to take a few minutes and begin to think at your tables about what your right next steps might be at St. Luke's. Well, who am I? I'm 73 years old. Laura and I have been married for 43 years. We have five children, four boys and a daughter. Um, we have four precious daughter-in-laws. For those of you who have daughter-in-laws, it, it's, they're, they're a gift. And we have six and a half grandchildren, six and under. So these daughter-in-laws of ours have been very busy. Um, I have lived east of the Mississippi my whole life. I have an undergraduate degree in economics and MBA from George Washington University in finance. And I've been blessed with three different careers. Um, very different careers. My first one is, was in Atlanta when I opened an art gallery that sold 20th century fine art photography. The second career was in investment management business, and the third career has been uh, ministry to men. Um, I began in Lima, Ohio in 1949, which is in northwestern part of the state. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is give you just six uh, fence posts. We call them fast, fence posts in terms of a story about your life that focuses on six different uh, aspects. I did grow up in a Christian home, Presbyterian home. We went to church every Sunday, which I continue to be thankful to my parents for today. They laid that foundation and um, that, that discipline of church on Sunday. Um, I can't say that it was a spiritual, vibrant home, uh, but kind of like Len, I said that same prayer and we did pray at, at dinner, but it was pretty much Sunday focused. When I was 16, uh, I walked into our TV room and my parents were watching a, a crusade featuring Billy Graham. I didn't know Billy Graham, but I sat down to listen to his message about Jesus Christ. And it was transformational. I mean, I'd been in church, youth group, um, sermons, but I had never heard anybody talk about Jesus Christ the way Billy Graham did. And I was just transfixed by that. Um, so much so that I sent him my 25 cents and they started to send me materials in the mail. But uh, I didn't have a mentor. Um, 
My parents didn't pick up on all, all this literature I was getting from Billy Graham, but um, I decided that although I had decided to follow Jesus, I still wanted to do it my way. As Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. And so for the next 15 years, uh, although I was I wanted to follow Jesus, that's not the course I took. And it was a total mess. Um, enough said about that. It was a, it was a mess. And um, after Laura and I were married, we joined a Methodist church in Atlanta, Northside United Methodist Church. And I walked into that church and noticed there was something very different about this church from the other churches we had attended. That was, there was a masculine spirituality in part of that church that sort of engulfed that church that made it very different. The senior pastor and the lay leaders had developed an intentional ministry to men in the life of that church specifically for someone like me, an unformed Christian man. Um, so I stepped into that process and it was just amazing. I mean, I was gonna be a new father, I was a husband, I was a business owner, but I didn't really know how to live into any of those the way God wanted me to. So I stepped into that equipping formation process. Um, and I believe that is the primary focus a church needs to have is that a formation process, not over, only for the youth and young adults, and women, but for men in particular. We moved uh, three years after joining Northside, and, but I left at, in the formation process, praise the Lord, but I was also very passionate about men's ministry. We moved to Sarasota when I was 40 and uh, joined an Episcopal church. I'd never been in an Episcopal church, but we were captured by the sacraments and the liturgy uh, of that church. And we joined, uh, not long after we joined, I went to the rector, Jack Eicher, and I said, you know, do you, would, would you help me start a men's Bible study? And he agreed to do that. So we started the Friday Men's Prayer Breakfast in 1988 and it continues today. Um, Promise Keepers, for those of you who remember Promise Keepers, it was, it was transformational, uh, both in terms of the stadium experiences and the, the equipping that they did for men in local churches. Um, and so what we developed at Redeemer Church of the Redeemer in Sarasota was an intentional ministry to men. Now, I gotta confess too, I wanted to do that because I needed to know more about how to be a successful dad, a successful husband, a successful leader, a, a successful man living into God's image for me. Um, towards the end of that, the 90s, we had elected a new bishop, John Lipscomb, and he took me to lunch in 1999. I was still in the investment management business, uh, but he had seen what we had done at Redeemer and some other things that he and I had partnered on, and he invited me to serve on his staff as his coordinator for men's ministry. Uh, they had never had anything like that, and after prayer and, and discernment with the bishop and our rector, indeed, uh, I was called to do that. So I left the private sector. My kids were very concerned about their allowance continuing if I was in ministry. Uh, but that, that survived, and I stepped into full-time ministry. When I was 50, um, Mike, slide please. My oldest son, John, my oldest son, John, who is on the far end there, sorry about the color, I don't know what happened to the translation, but um, he turned 13, and I had been a very intentional dad from zero to 13 four boys, um, and it was just, you know, seeing the world together and, and just allowing them to experience that. But when he turned 13, I didn't really have a vision going forward. Um, kind of like J.D. was saying, you know, how, how am I gonna get to 18? And so I started to do some research. This was in the mid-90s, the internet wasn't anything. But I discovered something that seemed to be very significant to men in particular and young men rites of passage. So I cut and pasted a rite of passage process together for John, who by the way, when I asked him about this process that we were gonna go through, said yes. And that made all the difference, uh, obviously, but he said yes. It was a three-year process. Uh, it was a lot of life talking, 
uh, as you know, the, the talk about the birds and the bees is not one specific topic the way I received it. It's a conversation. Um, we went to back to Ohio uh, to see where my family was from. Uh, they settled in Ohio in 1795, where I went to college to show him a college campus and what that felt like. Uh, and it was a life issues weekend. The culmination of the three years was a rite of passage dinner for John. And we assembled, I assembled eight guys from our church, and we had a formal dinner. Each of the men did something that scared the dickens out of them, and that is they gave a, a faith story. Uh, most men have not done that, as Len did tonight. Um, they each did their faith story, I did, and, as, and John spoke to the men there about his faith journey. At the end of the dinner, uh, I asked John to step forward and the men surrounded him, he knelt down, and we, the men prayed over him. And then the, the key piece of this rite of passage is that as his dad, I blessed him with the words Jesus received when he, was, when he came out of the river in the Jordan, in the Jordan River, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It was transformational. There was a mystery to it that I can't explain today, but it is a powerful ceremony. What I've discovered since then is that every man is looking to have that father's blessing, however that happens. Um, last year at the men's conference, we offered that to the men's there, the men who attended, the, a, a surrogate father blessing. And it's just a, a, a powerful experience. And I was able to do that with my other three sons, in addition to a, a group of guys who've done this for their son in the life of the church in Sarasota. When I turned 60, I went to the Holy Land for the first time. I, it was a gift from the diocese in my church, a sabbatical gift, so I went. In 2009, uh, I had never really thought about going to the Holy Land, but couldn't turn down this gift. And I went, and for those of you who've been, it's transformational. Um, walking in the footsteps, uh, it's almost impossible to describe what that's like, but it, it, it too is transformational. I came home and I told my wife that I wanted to take her next year. In that year, God placed a, a big, holy, audacious vision on my heart to begin leading men to the Holy Land. Now that's not going to Camp St. Christopher. That's 5,500 miles from home. It's in the Middle East, seven time zones different, difference. But I partnered with the course director at St. George's College, which were, where we did our pilgrimages, and by the time we left in 2010, he had a 12-day men's pilgrimage designed for us. I came back, and uh, in 2011, we launched Behold the Man. Is that the next? There we go, that's this year with Dr. Peter Walker. This is on the Sea of Galilee, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. In 2012, we began to partner with the, the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, which we continue to do today. So it's a partnership between an Episcopal Diocese and an Anglican Diocese. Um, and it's just been an amazing experience for me. We'll be going again later this year. So I will invite all of you uh, with uh, JD's direction to, to join us. In 2011, Laura and I, um, our kids, our, old, old, our youngest son was off to college, and we prayed to God that we would do whatever he asked us to do because he had blessed us so immeasurably, uh, particularly as parents. Um, we set that phone aside. Two years later, it rang. Um, he was going to make good for the offer we provided, or we asked for. And um, what happened was that spring of 2011, Laura's niece came to stay with us for her spring break. She was in the eighth grade living in New Jersey with her family. I didn't know it at the time, but she was really speaking into Laura's heart about the toxic environment in which she was living with her, with her family. Um, this is Olivia. So we had a daughter a most unusual way. She ran away from home to us in 2011 as a freshman in high school. As I've described to you, we raised four boys. Now, for those of you who have daughters and sons, this isn't a big deal. But for me, it was a really big deal. I didn't have a clue about daughters. 
Um, I did find a book, though, that was very important to me called Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. And I had a group of guys at the church that came around me, laughed at me, and helped me walk through those four years. By the time, by the sophomore year, I wanted to adopt Olivia. Olivia arrived as a nun, N-O-N-E. She had no faith background. She had been baptized once, Len. Um, and, um, but she'd never been to church. She didn't have a Bible. So we put back on our disciple-making hats, and we took her to church. We took her to youth group. We prayed for her. I put the Lord's Prayer on her mirror. We took her to Young Life. And in uh, June of 2012, at a Young Life camp, she gave her life to the Lord and continues today as a, an amazing Christian woman. So back to what Lynn was talking about. This, is, this all had to do with um, faith in the home, men. Again, that is our most important um, mission field. And, you know, we did a, a workshop at the men's conference uh, two weekends ago. And we did, a work, we did a workshop on faith in the home. And, you, you know, the, the struggle men are having our age is their grandchildren. Uh, will, the, will, the grand, will the parents step up and do what we have done for our children um, in, in the lives of their, grand, of their grandchildren? Um, but I feel like Caleb at 73. You know, Caleb, one of my heroes in the Bible, he was with Joshua when he was 40 and they went into the promised land and he came back and Moses made him a promise. That promise was not fulfilled until 45 years later when he was 85. And he came to Joshua and said, I now want that promise that I was given 45 years ago and I want it tomorrow. And th the focus of that was to take this mountain. It was not an easy just walk through and take something. And that's the way I feel about men's ministry today. We continue to want to take that mountain. But this position, this work, does not come without significant challenges. So I want to turn our attention to two of those challenges. The social and cultural pushback against masculinity. The second one, how this radical social trend has impacted some denominations and churches. Mike, the next slide. The next one. Richard Reeves uh, published a book in 2022 entitled Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. Let me just explain to you the, this, what's on the, on the board there. In June of 1955, Adelaide Stevenson, former Illinois governor and two-time presidential candidate, addressed the all-female graduating class at Smith College. On a warm Massachusetts afternoon, he told them that as, a future, as future wives, they had an important role to play in ensuring that their husband was truly purposeful and to keep them whole. At the time, this seemed like an innocuous enough statement, even from the leading progressive of the, of the day. 16 years later, in 1971, the commencement speech was given by a woman who had been a Smith College junior when Stevenson spoke in 1955. It was a markedly different commencement speech. The speaker began by labeling God as she, then highlighted the political significance of the female orgasm, and most importantly described marriage as an institution designed for the subjugation of women. Her name was Gloria Steinem the feminist activist. Since the 1960s, men have become the liberal and secular worlds and some mainline denominations target maybe a curiosity and the gender needing a great deal of reform. Even last week, the husband of Vice President Kamala Harris in an interview explained that it was time for to toxic masculinity to take a back seat. I don't have the faintest idea how he even ventured into that comment, but just shows you what's going on. 
Now I say this because those of us here tonight in our 70s, we lived through the social upheavals of the 1960s and 70s. Um, for some of you guys, younger guys, um, maybe Matthew um, and John and a couple other guys, the 60s, can you believe there were three assassinations in that decade and we survived? I mean, it, it's what happened in that, that decade. Now, for a while, as I mentioned earlier about the mess that I lived during my 20s, uh, I, di I did believe it. I bought it and I drank the Kool-Aid of this upheaval. Why not? Free love was part of it, guys. What single man doesn't want to participate in free love? But of course, the movement uh, at the time forgot to come to terms with, as I painfully learned, there is no such thing as free love except by living in union with God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. But social and cultural change was out of the bag. The great feminine movement beginning in the 70s continues today, the Me Too movement, equal rights amendment, equal pay. With this tsunami of a movement came huge negative connotations for men labeled as, as I mentioned earlier, toxic masculinity, or worse, the ongoing characterization of men as misogynic, described as ingrained prejudice against women. As Christian men caught in the middle of this movement, Pastor John Tyson put the situation this way. These are confusing times for men. Sociologists tell us our biology is both oppressive and irrelevant to understanding gender in the modern life. Theologians tell us we have to either lead women because God designed them to submit or dismiss gender entirely and just focus on the spiritual gifts present in each, each lives. In the workplace, gender differences are both celebrated and weaponized. At the same time, well, that which we feel we can bring to the table as men is often trivialized or criticized in stereotypical ways that don't line up with who we actually are. Tyson continues, to be clear, I'm not trying to say men are victims. We have held majority of control throughout human history and have at times done so very badly. We have used our power in ungodly ways and done things, done some tremendous damage. I am, however, trying to articulate the frustration many men feel in this time of correction and overcorrection around masculinity. I am worried all the debates and shaming are robbing us from living with full hearts. I am worried that the strength men bring to the world will be buried in fear as we are told we are a threat and not a gift. John Tyson puts this in a very succinct way, this confusing attitude about masculinity today in bold and dramatic terms. My father's generation, like your father's, sometimes referred to as the greatest generation, was probably the last of what, what I would call the traditional view of masculinity. For those of us known as baby boomers, we have been the tipping point of what was and what we are being told is a revised view of masculinity and gender. To the church, <clears throat> and what I have experienced for the past 25 years as this secular worldview has collided with the church. Again, I believe the primary purpose of the church is, is uh, formation, uh, equipping the disciples, the men and the women as disciple makers. The church is responsible for formation without intentional formation, for men at least, the, the most part of that not lack of formation is that we continue to uh, excel at ushering and or being pew-sitting, um, pew -sitting, pew -sitting, bless me, sponges. What I experienced from time to time in the Episcopal Diocese of Southwest Florida, and not, I have not experienced this here, were churches being hostile about creating a sustainable men's ministry. This was very painful experience indeed. I was unwelcome in some churches. These experiences forced me to confront a stark reality I refer to as benign neglect. 
Benign neglect is an attitude of ignoring an often delicate or undesirable situation that one is held to be responsible for dealing with. In some churches, social justice has replaced a focus on the gospel. Their worldview, their social justice worldview, these churches believe this is where our hearts should be, should be focused, and thus they're neglecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. One unintended consequence of this church attitude, according to David Murrow in his book, Why Men Hate Going to Church, some men today fear the church. He lists a few fears to highlight the panic that many may grip a man's heart when asked, would you like to go to church? One of those fears might sound like this. I'll hate going to church like when I was a kid. I'll lose control. I'll get stuck with some weirdo. If, he, if I become a Christian, I'll be soft. I may be invited to pray with a group of guys, and as an unexpected add-on, we have to hold hands. Christian men don't get much sex. I'm afraid of heaven and eternity of sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. Well, changing norms and benign neglect have created real barriers for men in the life of some churches creating for some an attitude of forlorn hope about men's ministry in the life of the church. What I mean is this, when we consider the future of men in the church, some would say that forlorn hope sums it up, as I have sometimes felt in the battlefield of men in the church. Because 25 years ago, as is still true today, leaders of men's ministry face a challenge. This ministry requires great courage, Len, Yes, indeed, but with what hope of success? But I say onward, Christian soldiers. In 2012, I was invited to Neshota Seminary to lead a seminar on men's ministry, to lead the weekend. And the students that showed up, there were 20 of them, I gave them a three by five index card to write down their expectations for the weekend. This is 2012. Len, that's that next slide. Okay, here are a few of the 20 expectations. I would like a deeper insight into how to reach out to men. How to, how to do men's discipleship. How do I provide an environment in the church where men want to, be, want to participate? I want to be better equipped to minister to men. I want to, I want to learn about healing the father's so, wound for myself and other men. These insights were amazing, these expectations and insights for me about the hunger there is in the life of the church about actually dealing with men and their formation. After the seminar, I took these cards and uh, I started to reflect on them and I was sharing them with a friend of mine and he said, listen, you've been in men's ministry for 25 years, you should write a book about it, which I did in 2012 and was published in 2013, Men in the Church is Their Future. Next slide. It is a playbook as as Len is learning for men in the church and it provides a sustainable model for men in the church to go forth together as a team for facing the changing social norms and history of neglect by the church to build God's kingdom man to man. That is the point of men's ministry in the life of the church. One of the first steps I believe that we need to take hold of and account of is to invite men to forget about this social norm uh, situation and look to our biblical model for manhood, Jesus Christ's model. Next slide, uh, Mike. His model for authentic manhood was to reject passivity, accept responsibility, to lead courageously, and to expect the greater reward, God's reward. Jesus, as most of you know, is sometimes referred to as the second Adam. During his lifetime, he did a 180 turn on Adam's manhood model. Jesus harnessed the passion of masculinity in those four points. This was his identity. We need to adopt this definition for ourselves as men of the church, to reject passivity, to accept responsibility, 
to lead courageously and to expect the greater reward, God's reward. Second, to over overcome benign neglect in the church, as J.D. pointed out, we need to stand up men as the men of the church and overcome benign neglect. We're gonna to need to courageously stand up and confidently implement the model of ministry that Jesus gave us. Next slide. What was Jesus' model for ministry? He first called the men. In Mark 16, 20, the fact is that we disciples of Jesus Christ are already in the church. We have 40 plus disciples right here. You're in the church. Um, he then trained them, trained them up. With the model, prepare them for a big, holy, audacious adventure. Our ministry model vision in the diocese is equipping today's men to be tomorrow's disciple makers. He poured his life into these guys. Gentlemen, I, the, the blessing to have the opportunity to pour my life into other men is beyond description. Um, and, and for those of you who are to be, already experienced that, you know it. Um, he poured into them, into 12 men using his model. For three years, they watched, listened, and imitated their master, their mentor, and he sent them on a big, holy, audacious adventure to transform the world. Now this is really important. Jesus was sending competent, confident, and equipped disciples as disciple makers. Matthew 28, 19, full disclosure on the Great Commission. When I heard that, I would break into a cold sweat. Go to all nations? I, I, that just terrified me. But then I discovered Acts 1, 8, and a more achievable command. In, John, in Acts 1, 8, uh, Jesus narrowed his sending expectations for most of us. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and I shall, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the home, and in all Judea, your workplace, and Samaria, your community, and then to the ends of the earth. Again, Jesus' model was he called them, you're here, he trained them, we're gonna do that, poured into them as JD does and the leaders of your men's ministry, and then he sent them. Let's go to the next slide, Mike, if this comes up all right. You have this on your table. This is the ministry model that we've developed for the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina for the men. It's called a flywheel because it has a weight in it that after a certain number of rotations, it has its own momentum. So again, we start with the church. This is where the formation takes place, the equipping in our churches. The disciples, you're here. We've got you. You're here at one level or another in terms of your decision to follow Jesus. The next thing is to begin to provide transformational programming. <clears throat> Go make disciples, that's our goal, as equipped, competent, confident men. Sending you out, our goal with that formation is sending you back to the mission, your greatest and most important mission field, and that's your home. And the con process continues until that momentum has increased to the point where men's ministry in the life of the church is a given. You can feel it, as I felt it at Northside United Methodist Church, that masculine flavor. He called them, you have been called. He trained them, equipped them. In this packet that, that I laid on your table, you'll have a whole list of program opportunities. He poured into them. Guys, I, I do want you to remember two by two. Um, it, it was, a, it was a, a motto of Billy Graham. He never went any place by himself. He sent them, again, number one, mission field is our home. Okay, there you go. A to Z. What I'd like for you to do for just a couple minutes is to look at the sheet of paper that I gave you and just jot down one or two things that struck your fancy that, that you see will be important in the life of St. Luke's going forward to make 
a sustainable men's ministry in the life of the church. You're welcome. We got these uh, lights working just as you were going on stage, Jay, so there we go. Um, well, I know we're, we're coming to the end, and Jay, thank you, as always. I, I, I always assumed you were ordained because of just the sort of spiritual wisdom. No, thank you very much. From you. I don't thank know you, Jay. Very, um, but I, I do want to end, just, and I will be brief, if you can believe it, um, to let you know that this is um, often men um, don't come to church in part because it is a haranguing fest about all of their failures, and they say, well, I already have a, a mother-in-law, I, uh, I don't need another one, you know, and I don't need to tell you, I know I should be, um, um, you know, talk softer and be gentler and all the various things that I think, as Jay was alluding to, are not necessarily what uh, we were designed to be. And so I want you to know that my commitment to you is to embrace and to, um, to, to walk into and to consider uh, the goodness of what it means that God has called us to be men. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's not a zero-sum game. You know, after the fall, men and women in their relationship became zero-sum. It was, if, if you have power, then you must have taken it from me. Or if you have success, then you must have taken it from me. And this is something that we see in Genesis 3 itself. That the desire, or the curse of the fall was that the desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And that, ver that uh, word in Hebrew is only used two other times, both negatively, uh, well, it's used in the Song of Solomon sort of amb ambiguously, but the other time most immediately was in Genesis chapter six, um, uh, yes, no, four, immediately afterwards, when Cain was warned that the devil would be prowling around and would be desirous of his life. So this was not like a hubba hubba desire. This was that now he has, the, the relationship is broken to the extent that you will, be, you will be suspicious of him. You will wonder whether he has your best interest at heart and you will be um, in competition with him. And then of course the curse for men was that you will, um, you will work your whole life in the attempt of finding meaning, purpose, and value, and yet your, your sum total will be thorns and thistles and that you will return to dust. And so we have this pitted relationship at the heart of the sinfulness of the reality that Jesus has come to address and to restore so that we can be men and women of, in the image of God to his glory. And the church is the place where that can be celebrated. Now, to be sure, as Jay has said, we have, we have felt fallen many ways, but we don't have to. And we can confess that fault and be restored every single morning. So when we look at what it means to be a man, we're not saying it's good to be a man because we're not women. We're saying that it's good for strong men to exist in a world where strong women also exist so that together they can evince the image of God in strength to a lost and hurting world. And that's what we're, that's what we're celebrating here. So um, stay tuned. You know, I'm a work in progress, as we all are. You know, I got a sweet text from my dad yesterday who's um, 75 and he was remarking on the some of you may have heard my sermon where I mentioned the the years that the locusts have eaten that the Lord was returning and he was even remarking in his age he says that's such a meaningful verse for me and of course I'm still learning that even now and I said mm -hmm. well you know amen and amen and so that's where we are with you all and so again stay tuned there's a lot of collected wisdom in this room there's a lot of um, things that have been done well, and there's a lot of, a lot of lessons that have been learned that can also be um, instructional for people as they are raised. You know, some of our best pre-marriage counselors are the ones who've had the most um, spectacular failed marriages. You know, this is um, because they say, well, here's, here's a list of things not to do, for instance. And so when we talk about being men, first and foremost, the importance, as Tom mentioned, is to show up, you know, to try to sing, to try to be involved, to be visible, because you're a witness and you are a sermon in your own life for the people around you. And then prayerfully consider, you know, speaking up. Maybe one of you wants to do a testimony next time. Maybe one of you wants to, to, to get involved in a little bit more and, and listen to that voice, because it could very easily be the Holy Spirit you know, prompting you to greater levels of, of public witness for what the Lord has simply done for you and with you and in you, which is um, your story, but one that you have been given to shepherd and to share with the world. So let's stand and sing as best.